Hello, good evening, and welcome to another Facebook Live. Uh, my name is Alec. I'm the MD of Wound Care People and JCN. And tonight's session is Wound Exudate Getting the Balance Right. A uh, bit of housekeeping before we start. First and foremost, I'd like to thank Convertech, who are our sponsors for this evening. Uh, very pleased to be working with them to bring you this event. Uh, I'm joined this evening by Lisa Wood and Luxmi Doon uh, Moon. Um, Luxmi, Lisa, how are you? Good. On mute. Good, thank, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so they, there you go. This is uh, already proves that we are uh, that we are live. Um, before I hand over to you to uh, to do the presentation, I'm just going to go through a tiny little bit of housekeeping as usual. Uh, first and foremost, you'll notice that we are presenting from our homes. So uh, if we do have any technical issues, please do bear with us. Please ask as many questions as you possibly can using the chat panel. We'll be coming back after the presentation for a live Q and A. Uh, so do, uh, do, do uh, join in. Engagement is a really important part of these events. Uh, certificate links will be available at the end, so you can download the certificate for attendance. Uh, I think that's it from me. So I'm going to hand over to, uh, to you two, and I will join you again after the presentation for the live Q&A. Um, good luck. I know you're both really excited for this evening, and I'm looking forward to uh, watching along. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much, Alec. So I'm Lisa Wood. I am one of the clinical strategy manager team for Convertech. And I'm here this evening to talk to you all about Exudate. So really my aim for this session is to get you as excited about wound Exudate as I am, which is a strange thing to say, I'm sure. So this evening we'll be focusing on what Exudate is, what it tells us, how important it is to get the right balance and importantly, how to manage these really challenging wet wounds. And like Alex said, it'd be great if you have any questions, please pop them down and Luxmi and I will do our best to answer as many of them at the end as we possibly can. So what actually is Exudate? Well, it's predominantly water. There are electrolytes, there's nutrients present, we've got inflammatory mediators, We've got white blood cells, we have MMPs, growth factors and waste products. So there's a lot of stuff in our wound exudate. It's actually really important. It's an important aspect of wound healing and it's a normal response to an injury. And it actually helps our wounds heal by preventing the wound bed from drying out which helps to support the migration of that new epithelial tissue, which migrates across the surface of a moist wound bed. Exudate carries essential growth factors, which are needed for cell regeneration to give that burst of energy for new tissue growth. And Exudate also helps to separate dead or devitalized tissue from the wound surface. So it supports that um, natural aut autolysis. So at the end of the day, wound healing is about moisture balance and it's about getting that balance right. So if the wound is too wet, we need to mop it up. If it's too dry, we need to make it wetter to make it better. We're trying to always get the moisture balance into an equilibrium and all the different dressings on the market will fit onto this scale. So it's really important that you know where each dressing sits on the scale and we'll go into that in a bit more detail later on. But if you think quite simply, if it's too wet, we need to remove that moisture, that excess moisture. And to do that, we need a dressing that will absorb, retain, trap all of that, that moisture within the dressing itself. We also might want something that's gonna to help to debride that wound and potentially manage infection if that's the reason the wound is particularly wet. On the flip side, if the wound is too dry, we need to make it wetter, like I say, to get it better. So we might need to add moisture. And there's different ways we can do that by adding things like a hydrogel or a hydrocolloid, for example, something occlusive to actually make that wound become more moist. There is a wealth of evidence out there to support the fact that wounds heal quicker in a moist environment compared to those which dry out and form a scab. In fact, the evidence is out there that suggests that wounds will heal two to three times faster in a moist wound environment. And they often have a much 
um, healthier, stronger outcome once they have healed. Yet, interestingly, we still have some patients and some of our healthcare professional colleagues that actually insist on leaving wounds open to the air to dry out. And some examples of that that I've seen in relatively recent times, patients that are left with their wounds exposed, sitting outside of the hospital, allowing their wounds to be open to the air for them to dry out. Um, I've had patients that have told me that they've gone to the seaside, they've taken their leg bandages off to have a paddle in the sea because the salt water and the fresh air will help to heal their wounds. And this is quite a long time ago. Um, I walked onto a ward to find a nurse at the instruction of the doctor um, drying a leg ulcer with a hairdryer. And I won't even begin to go <laughs> where, what's wrong with that whole picture. But there is still a lot of people out there that have that misconception that we need to leave our wounds open to the air in order for them to actually heal. So like I said before, it's important to remember that exudate is a normal part of healing. But we know in the wrong amount and in the wrong you know, consistency, it can become a problem. Like most things in life, like wine, for example, too much of a good thing can be bad for you. So I've got a couple of images here to show you. The image on the left shows a really dehydrated abdominal wound. You can see that the wound edges have become very desiccated, dry and scabby, and that wound bed has no moisture on it whatsoever. So those poor epithelial cells that need moisture in order to be able to swim across the surface of that wound can't do that. So we've stopped that cell migration, which means that wound is definitely going to be delayed in healing. On the other side of things, as you can see there, the foot wound, that shows maceration of those wound edges. And that's where the skin's become overloaded with fluid and it's become that white, boggy and soggy tissue. It's the sort of tissue you see on your fingers when you've been in the bath for a long time or washed up, for example. As much as I love Exudate, there are times where too much of it's a bad thing, but there are times where actually we need a dry environment. And for this, these are the types of wounds where it's an ischemic wound, a fungating wound, for example, patients who are immunocompromised. And for these types of patients with these types of wounds, really what we're looking at is prevention of infection and trying to manage or improve a patient's quality of life. Also, there is guidance regarding pressure ulceration, particularly on the feet and the heels, where in some instances it's best to keep that dry. But of course, follow your local guidance and policies on that. So what causes excess exudate? Well, we really need to assess our patient to fully understand why their wound is behaving in the way it actually is. Is it a normal inflammatory response to an injury, for example? Is it a response to an inflammation perhaps caused by infection? Does the patient have um, congestive cardiac failure, which is causing them to have a lot of edema? If there is edema present, it's important that we try and establish the cause of it. You know, is it due to venous insufficiency? Is it infection? Is it CCF? Is there lymphedema? And the other thing we need to take into consideration is perhaps just checking our patient's albumin levels. So we've got some lovely pictures here, which give you some really nice examples of what poor exudate management can do to the skin. So you can see on the picture on the left, that peri wound maceration. You can see where the skin's become quite boggy and soggy, where the dressing hasn't been able to trap and absorb that exudate within it. So you can see the wound itself is quite small. Um, you can see where the exudate's been pulled up into the dressing. It's then spread across that dressing and then being able to squish back down onto that surrounding skin. And that's what's caused that, that maceration. And you can actually see it starting to become quite red and demarcated, which is where we're starting to see the signs of excoriation. 
to overcome this, it's possible that for this particular wound, we just need a slightly more absorbent dressing, or perhaps that we need to increase the number of dressing changes for that particular patient. The picture on the right, you can see there, which we've classed as demarcation of exudate. What that means is it's showing you exactly where the dressing has been in situ. So what's happened is the foam dressing has been in place. It's absorbed all of that exudate into the dressing and spread it across the whole surface of that foam dressing and allowed it to sit on the surface of the skin. This has allowed the skin to absorb some of that moisture, making it quite swollen. And again, it becomes quite boggy and the granulation tissue can start to become quite fragile, but you can really see the outline, the whole shape of the dressing where it's been in, in situ. And again, the way to manage and resolve this really is by using something more absorbent or by increasing the number of dressing changes for that particular patient at that time. Erythema can be really uncomfortable for the patient because it's the corrosive nature of the exudate starts to irritate and burn that skin. And you do hear some patients saying that their surrounding skin is more painful for, than the wound itself. And that's often a sign that erythema is present. So you kind of can get an idea of that before you even remove the dressing by what the patient is actually telling you. I love that picture on the right. It's a really nice example of maceration. So that peri wound maceration. And it's literally where the heel has just been sat in a, in a heel cup type dressing and it's been bathing in its own juices for some time. And again, so you can see it's gone pruney, like your fingers would do if they've been soaked in water for a period of time. Now, with that in mind, if you think about your fingers and your toes after you've done the washing up, not with your toes, or in a bath, your fingers and toes might be a little bit pruney, but they don't stay pruney forever. Once they've become drier, that pruniness goes away. And that's the same with this type of maceration. If we remove that exudate from the skin, the issue will resolve. But obviously, if we don't change anything, the treatment stays the same, the wound will start to deteriorate and that peri-wound skin will undoubtedly start to break down. So when it comes to documenting and assessing exudate, what do you actually document? Do you document colour? You know, how important to you is the colour? What is it actually telling you? You know, what can you tell me about this wound? without even removing this dressing. When I first saw, when I saw this patient, I was very excited because the picture was just a beautiful example of, of pseudomonas. So just looking at that piece of gauze trapped underneath a film dressing, you can see without even removing this dressing, you've got a relatively high level of exudate for what is supposed to be a closed incision. You've got pseudomonas infection present because you can tell that by the colour, that luminous yellowy, greeny blue colour. OK, on top of that, you know that because of the amount of exudate sitting there trapped against the skin, that when you remove that dressing, it's likely to be macerated, if not excoriated underneath that piece of gauze. And just a side note, gauze is not a dressing. It doesn't absorb anything. If you think of like a sponge, it will suck it up, but it doesn't do anything with it. It then can just squish back down onto, onto the whatever surface it's on. And that is the same with gauze. It doesn't absorb or hold exudate at all. The other thing to bear in mind is think about the consistency of the exudate that you're looking at. So in this case, I think the only way I can really describe it is like the snot bubble that only a toddler can blow. It's that quite thick, quite mucousy type of exudate, very viscous in appearance and texture. So exudate is telling us an awful lot. We're actually able to learn a lot about this wound without even removing the dressing, just because of what we're seeing. And it's the exudate that is showing us that. So how do we actually document it? Well, thinking about the color, Let's look at that in a bit more detail. So you'll have straw colored 
exudate. And that's what we often call serous fluid. OK, this is a normal type of exudate. It's what we would expect to see after any type of injury. It's that normal inflammatory wound exudate. However, know your patient's history and where the location of this wound is, because it could potentially be a lymphatic wound or, or it could be due to um, a urinary fistula that you're seeing that clear fluid. If it's yellow brown in colour, then it might be due to the presence of slough or necrosis that's starting to be broken down. It could be one of those situations where we're making it wetter to get it better. So we're starting to see that sort of browny yellow um, color of exudate. It could be red pink. If it's red pink, it might suggest that actually the exudate contains some um, blood cells, red blood cells, which might indicate that there's an infection present or it could be trauma from the removal of that dressing. And if it's cloudy or milky in um, appearance, it could be down to the presence of fibrin. And that tends to be as a response to inflammation, which could be a response to infection. If it's smelly, if it's thick, if it's pussy, it contains white blood cells and bacteria. If it's green, then it would suggest that we are dealing with infection, something like Pseudomonas, for example. And Pseudomonas bacteria absolutely thrives in environments that are particularly wet. Just you might see other types of exudate um, colour. Sometimes it could be grey blue, and that could be as a result of using particular dressings, and in some instances, some silver dressings. Exudate will give you a good clue as to whether that wound has becoming infected. So I would always say to you, so long as you have a sense of smell, go with your gut. If it's a particularly smelly wound, then there's a chance that there's infection present. If it's a smell you can taste, and you all know what I mean by that, if it's a smell that sticks with you for some time after you've seen that patient, then the chances are you really are dealing with quite um, a severe infection. So how do we document the quantity of a wound? It is a really subjective measure at the end of the day, and it will come down to your experience a lot of the time, you know, the types of wounds that you've dealt with, how many wounds you've dealt with in your time, the areas that you work within, for example. Um, giving away possibly a little bit of my age, when I first started nursing, we did the plus, 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 and it goes on and on and on. That was our way of saying how much exudate there was present. Sometimes we might use terms like low, medium, high, minimal, moderate, heavy, none, scant, moderate, heavy. Again, it's really quite subjective. The only way we can really get an idea of, of exudate levels is by weighing the dressing before it goes on and then weighing it when we take it off and, and assume that that increase in weight is down to the amount of exudate that that dressing has absorbed. That's assuming that dressing has held all of that exudate within it. As we know, a lot of the time it can be leaking out. So it's not always giving us that best judge, even if we're weighing them. So there is a consensus document that came out um, by the World Union of Wound Healing Society back in 2007. And this has been updated again in 2019. It's a really good consensus document on managing wound exudate. And actually the terms they suggest that we use is dry, moist, wet, saturated and leaking. But that very much helps us when there's already a dressing in place and also assuming that the dressing is appropriate. Because if you've just got a piece of gauze stuck on a wound that's very heavily exuding, it will be leaking. Doesn't necessarily mean that the wound itself is heavily exuding. So it's very much down to the efficacy really of the treatment that you're putting on. But here we give you some examples of what we mean. So this is what we would class as a dry wound. It's a wound bed that is dry. 
So if you think about when you're taking that primary dressing off, there's no marking on it. It's completely clear. There's no signs of exudate on that, that primary dressing whatsoever. A moist wound is where we've got small amounts of fluid visible. The primary dressing might be slightly marked. So if you look at the image on the left, you can see it's, it's just got a slight shine to it where it has got that little bit of moisture on the wound surface. The picture on the right shows the primary dressing in situ and you can see that it has slightly marked, but it is only slightly. A wet wound is where when you've removed the dressing, you can see moisture on that wound surface. It's wet, okay. Also, you can see that the primary dressing is extensively marked. So whatever primary dressing's on there, it's really showing that it's collecting that exudate within it. But it hasn't struck through to the next, the, the secondary layer. A saturated dressing is where the primary dressing is soaking wet. So it's wet through with strike through. So if you look at that image there, you can see that the primary dressing is very, very marked and you can see it has leaked through onto the secondary dressing which we could class as that strike through. That wound, once it's cleansed, will probably look quite macerated where the exudate has been trapped against the skin and the dressing has, has become a little bit um, too, too wet. Now, a leaking wound is kind of what you would expect it to be. Um, a leaking dressing, it's where the dressing has become completely saturated. The exudate is escaping it's marked the primary and the secondary dressing, and it's probably leaked through all the bandages and now onto the patient's clothes, bed sheets, you know, into their shoes. Um, and these are the types of wounds that actually require a lot more dressing changes than you would normally expect for this particular wound type, for example. One of the things that we really need to take into consideration when we're looking after patients with particularly wet wounds, or I mean, any wound will have an impact on a patient's quality of life and their mental health, but particularly wet, leaky wounds will have potentially more challenges for that patient. So if you're thinking about leakage and that soiling of, of a, a dressing, the images here obviously are not what we would recommend as, as tr treatments, but sometimes this is what our patients rock up to clinic with their bandages looking like. You can see that top picture there. You've just got a really simple retention bandage from the toe to the ankle. Bandages really need to go from toe to knee, regardless of where the wound is. And it, it looks quite tight, doesn't it? And you can see where that exudate is leaked through. And again, we're seeing those signs of pseudomonas infection. The picture below that is the very glamorous patient rocking up with the carrier bag footwear. It's where they've removed a lot of the compression therapy or the outer bandages because they often don't like them. But because of gravity, all the exudate is running down their leg and pulling in their footwear. So rather than ruin their shoes, they wear the beautiful carrier bag. So you can imagine the state their feet are in bathing themselves in their own exudate all of the time. So these are really bad ways of managing exudate. So we need to think about why these things are leaking. Why is the dressing the way it is? Is it because it is a, an inappropriate dressing or has it been applied incorrectly? Are you not getting a decent seal? So if you're using an adhesive dressing, for example, are you making sure there's no creases, that it's completely in contact with the patient's skin? You might need something that's more absorbent, something that will handle the exudate better, absorb it, retain it, lock it in. You might need a more absorbent secondary dressing, for example. And in some cases, you just need some extra help and you might want to refer on to a specialist. When you're thinking about odour, a lot of the time exudate will have an odour to it. So we need to establish what is creating that smell. Is it down to the fact that we're liquefying necrotic tissue because that really does have an odour? We're, we're trapping decomposing flesh underneath a, a dressing for a period of time and it's wet and it's soggy, so it will smell. So if we can remove that necrosis, that dead tissue, that will help to reduce the smell. 
It could be infection. Again, if we manage that bio burden, remove that infection, the smell will go away. We might just need to increase the amount of times we're changing that dressing. And if we're dealing with something particularly malodorous, something perhaps like a fungating tumour, for example, we might want to consider things like um, a charcoal dressing to help us manage that odour. We need to think about how uncomfortable these wounds can be. These wet, leaky, painful wounds can cause some real problems for our patients. You know, again, try and understand what the cause of that discomfort is. Speak to your patient, ask them questions, listen to their answers. Is there infection present that's causing a change in the pain? Is the dressing sticking to the wound bed? When does the patient get the pain? Is it a dressing change? Is it all the time? Yeah. Maybe it's something that's drying out and sticking to the wound bed. Maybe it's maceration or excoriation that's causing that discomfort. Once you've identified the cause of that discomfort, we can manage it better by you know, speaking to our patients about taking analgesics before they come and see us and have their dressings changed. We also have to think about how tolerant our patients are to the, the, the pain that they have, to the wound that they have. Everybody will cope with their wounds in very, very different ways. And we need to understand the impact it has on our patients and what they are trying to achieve in their day-to-day -day life. With that in mind, one of the biggest challenges I guess we have when we're dealing with venous leg ulcers is trying to get our patients to adhere to the treatment plans that we're putting in place. You know, we're looking sometimes at bulky bandages for a period of time to help reduce that edema and manage the exudate until we can get them into something a little bit more manageable like compression garments, for example. If we can get our patients involved in the treatment plan they're more likely to understand why we're doing what we're doing and they're more likely to, to stick to your treatment plan. Think about any of the emotional distress that that patient might be getting from their wound. You know it may be something as simple as not being able to sleep in the same bed as their, their partner anymore because they're concerned that their wound is going to leak all over the bed sheets for example. And we know that obviously having a, a wound, especially something that's very, very wet, may stop you being able to go to work. You know, it could then have an impact on your social life, your finances. It can really have a, a significant impact on how you, you live. Um, I have recently looked after a gentleman with a really nasty venous leg ulcer um, who was a bus driver. He wasn't allowed to work while he had this wound and it was particularly wet. But that was very much his life. And he, he was ending up being off work. I think it was for about eight months until they came to a, an agreement for him to leave, um, which is a shame because that's all he wanted to do. And, and the wound really had a significant impact on, on his life. So what can we do? about these really wet wounds. We know they are a challenge. So what, what can we do about them? Well, first off, we need to understand why they are behaving in the way they are behaving. So we need to assess for any contributing factors and to manage those effectively. So it could be something like venous disease, you know, that's the problem. We can put wonderful dressings on there, but unless we address that underlying cause, all we're doing is symptom control. We need to prioritize the aims of our treatment. Hopefully we've gone long, long away from what I used to write in my first care plans, which was to heal the wound and to prevent infection. Set short-term treatment objectives that are realistic. They will help you choose your dressing and make sure that you're doing things effectively. So your short-term objective could be to manage excess exudate and protect the peri wound skin. Something as simple as that. And you need to monitor these wounds really closely because they do change very, very quickly. So managing the exudate can be a challenge, as we've said. What we tend to do after we've adopted all these, these um, treatments and managing to cope with the underlying comorbidities, what we tend to do is reach for the dressings. And it's 
there are so many dressings out there. It can get really confusing to know which to use for when. So you might have a nice simple dressing. There are multi-layered dressings. We've got vacuum assisted dressings. We've got antimicrobial dressings. There's so many out there. So for you to actually choose the right one, set yourself your realistic short-term treatment objective. Look at the dressing and decide whether it will meet those needs. So is it going to mop up the exudate? Will it manage that exudate accordingly? Think about the symptoms that you see on that particular wound. It could be that you're dealing with a wound that has a lot of exudate. Consider the dressing that you need to be in place, that it's going to absorb, it's going to retain, it's going to lock in that exudate within that dressing and not allow it to squish out on that surrounding skin. It will protect that peri wound tissue. It will help to clean the wound bed. So again, I've got some images here where you can see um, a picture on the left where you've got the hand with the dressing on. The dressing there has absorbed that exudate and trapped it within the fibres of the dressing, not allowing it to spread on that surrounding skin. So it's protecting that peri wound tissue. Whereas, as you've seen before, the foam dressing there, it's absorbed that exudate, but it hasn't locked it in. It hasn't held it within the, the dressing itself. So it's spread out and caused maceration of that surrounding skin. So I'm now going to hand over to Lakshmi, who is actually going to share with you a couple of case studies, really nice examples of effective exudate management. So I'm going to hand over to Lakshmi. Thank you, Lisa, for such a brilliant introduction to the subject. Very good evening to you all, and thank you for tuning to this session. Being a TVN in the community myself, we see quite a lot of complex, challenging wounds, but at the same time, we also see the impact they can have on our patient lives. Hence, in these case studies today, I will be sharing with you some of our practices and the experience of working with the patient and for the patient. The first case study is about my patient who has a diabetic foot ulcer, 50 year old gentleman who had an ulcer on the third metatarsal, also present for a period of three months, more than three months. At pre before referral, he was uh, being seen and dressed three times a week. As you can see from the pictures, the surrounding skin was very macerated. Although the wound itself was 15 by 15 by seven millimeters, so quite a small wound, but the extent of damage was quite high. And I am sure that today's session, whoever is attended, you would have seen something like that on your caseload. It is very, very common. Although the wound bed appears very small on these photograph, the patient um, impact that he had on the patient itself was quite a lot and the peri wound damage inability to wear appropriate shoe because of the leakage increase and um, the frequency of dressing change that you know patient didn't like was all impacting on his quality of life so as clinicians we always need to consider what matters most to the patient so having that patient-centered approach and managing what really matters to them makes a massive difference to their holistic uh, management. And very often it also increased concordance to the care plan. So clinical aim for this patient was, we need to manage the exudate more effectively so that we can reduce the peri wound maceration. We also need to ensure there's rapid debridement of the sloughy tissue present within the wound. And by that, it will also promote rapid granulation from the base of the wound. Reducing the, the exudate will also help to reduce the number of dressing change, but we also need to do that safely so that at the same time, we know we're supporting the healing process. So for this patient, what we actually did was review the dressing regime. Aquacel Extra was selected as the primary dressing to manage the exudate challenges and a secondary absorbent pad was applied. Within one week, and us nurses, we love pictures. Within just one week of application, you can see the peri wound macerated margin has reduced already. And the second picture will speak for itself again. As you can see, the maceration is almost gone, but the wound bed has also reduced in size 
and actually the depth has reduced as well. And that's just less than four weeks of reviewing the regime, ensuring we were managing the exudate more effectively. So what happened for this patient is within a month of treatment, we we're using Aquacel Extra. The wound bed had actually reduced by 50% in size, but as the wound had decreased, so did the exudate volume, which means the dressing was staying longer. Using the hydrofiber dressing, which locks away the exudate, the, the periwin area was also protected. That means, as Lisa said in the presentation, it was not being um, put back to the skin, causing maceration. And this has helped the wound to progress to healing, but also at the same time helped the debridement of the sloughy tissue where granulation was promoted, which means new healthy tissue was there. And for us, what matters is the patient was happy with less dressing changes. He was able to wear his shoe without the fear of getting soiled. And clinician was happy because the satisfaction we get when we see wound progressing towards healing, only a nurse can tell, like, tell you that. My next case study is something that we are seeing an increase in the community at the moment, managing a fungating tumor. This is an 86 year, year gentleman with a malignant fungating tumor on the neck. This wound was present for six months. As you can see, 100% slough, very wet, highly exuding wound. The current dressing was con con considerably wet and it was always impacting on the patient quality of life. But as a result, because of where it was, it was a challenge to keep the dressing in place. And this is one of the reasons why often there was leakage during the day, during the night. But for the patient, what really matters was not to heal that wound as you know we've heard earlier, so our aim was speaking to the patient, listening to their concern and finding out what really mattered to them and what is it that we want, they wanted us to address first. For him was not waking up at night, changing his pillowcase, not waking up in the morning with wet bedding and during daytime having exited down his neck and his clothes. And you know this is the simple management that he's wanting and not even healing the wound. So what we focus again was what really mattered to him and how we can work as a team to improve the, the, not only the situation, but also the patient confidence. Being in the community, I know it's not always possible to have dressing changes twice daily, especially with the staffing challenge that we're, we're facing all the time. So this symptom was a management was to how do we work with the nurses the community team and the patient to improve the quality of life, reduce the exudate, de-slough the wound bed, protect the peri-wound area, and at the same time, reducing the dressing frequency from twice a day and also enhancing his well-being by providing him more confidence that, yes, you can have a more decent sleep. You're not going to wake up in the middle of the night with a white pillowcase. It's not going to leak down your neck. It's not going to go in your clothes. And this is where we had to plan it properly with the patient. So what we did again, we've layered the wound bed with Aquacel and that was free dressing layered on top of each other. We then use a super absorbent and applied on it as per the dressing, the picture down there. Hyperfix was used to secure because it can be very gentle to the skin, but also it stays in place. As I said to you, pictures speak a million words and within three weeks, the wound bed is more granulating, less sloughy. That dressing actually stayed in place longer because as I said, the adhesive was more gentle, so it has preventing any dislodge of dressing. Patient wasn't waking up in the middle of the night anymore within three weeks. He had better night's sleep. He was more confident and he had actually started doing some of his activities of daily living, which is very, very important for our patient because that's what matters to them. What is it that they like doing? And the moment you take that away from them, you're taking their independence away. So this is why our care plan was patient-centered. So again, what we did for managing the exudate, uh, we've used what we call Convermax, which is a super absorbent. The exudate volume was managed effectively using both the super absorbent and Aquacel Extra, but at the same time, the Aquacel has enabled the debridement of the sloughy tissue. The dressing changes was reduced from twice daily to alternative days, which is every other day from 
twice daily. That is a massive improvement for the patient quality of life themselves, because he didn't have to sit and wait for nurses to come, he could get on with his life. And also at the same time, we have released what we call better nursing care, which means these patients uh, have had less visit from the nurses and the nurses had had more time for other patients. Exidate can be very challenging if not addressed properly, and this can lead to unnecessary costs. And this is one of the reasons it has to be managed with the patient, patient-centered. And in, in order to kind of deal with that more effectively, we need to not just be cost-effective, but also making sure it's safe, it works, and we're not in, doing inappropriate uh, for the patient to get more infection, but at the same time, we're reducing and improving the patient quality of life. So on this slide, I am now going to hand over to Lisa to summarize um, our presentation of tonight. Brilliant. Thanks ever so much, much Luxmi. That was really interesting. Um, some lovely examples there of, of um, exudate management. And I'm really pleased that the gentleman with that fungating tumour actually got a bit of his uh, quality of life improved from, from just twice daily dressings to alternate days is massive improvement for, for him, but also just takes a lot of the pressure off of those poor nurses going in twice a day. So my job now is just to summarize our presentation. So what I really want you to take away from tonight is remember that Exidate is a normal response to an injury and it's essential in promoting wound healing. However, as we now know, too little or too much can be detrimental to healing. If the exudate level is not right, it can cause problems for the patient, the wound, and it will become an increased burden on the healthcare service. And as you heard there, that's a really nice example. A very wet wound is being dressed twice a day. The dressing is only a small part of the cost of that. It's the nursing time takes up the predominant amount of that. And think that every time that those nurses are seeing that patient twice a day, they could be seeing somebody else. So yeah, it really does have a massive burden on healthcare system. A good assessment is absolutely key to identifying the potential problems with moisture balance and just getting it right. So selecting an appropriate treatment plan is absolutely key for promoting that wound onto healing. So my call to action is really manage Exudate effectively by, firstly, you need to understand it. Once you've understood it, you can then choose a dressing that will absorb, retain and protect. Now, if you want any more information on any of the products that have been mentioned during the session from Convertech, please contact your local representative or you can give the um, clinical support helpline a call or an email. But the phone number is a free phone number 0800 289 738. So that brings me to the end of our presentation. I'm now going to hand back over to Alec, who is going to chair the live question and answer session. Thanks very much, Alec. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lakshmi. Um, fantastic presentation. Can I just ask, how was it for you, your first, uh, your first time presenting? I think you both did a really, really good job. And, uh, and there, we, we've had uh, 1,100 people more watching this evening. Um, and they all been saying some really wonderful things about the uh, two of you. And as you can imagine, we've got lots and lots of questions. So are you, are you happy? Ecstatic. <laughs> good, good. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go straight on to the questions because we've, as you can imagine, we've got lots and lots of them. I'll start by saying... Um, if we don't get to answer your question this evening, we will, uh, as always, uh, respond to each of them individually. At a later date, what we do is we download all of the questions and then we'll pass them on to Lisa and Luxley, and then we'll get uh, responses um, and then put them into a document that will go on so, uh, onto our website alongside a, an edited vis version of this video and uh, where you can also download the slides from this evening. Um, so the first question is for you, Lisa, and this is, how do you manage heavily exuding cavity wounds? Oh, good question. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess it depends on the size of the cavity wound. In my head, when I hear the term cavity, I always think of something quite large, like a, you know, 
a category four or three, four pressure ulcer on a sacrum, for example. So if that was the case, you, the principles are still the same. You want to absorb, you want to retain that exudate within the dressing and you want to protect that peri wound skin. So for a large cavity wound, I'd probably use a hydrofiber dressing, a flat sheet scrunched up and put into the, the wound itself but making sure that it overlaps onto the surrounding skin so it does protect that peri wound skin. And if it was a small sort of sinus cavity, then I'd probably use the same sort of dressing, a hydrofiber dressing, but in the ribbon format so that you can really get it in and make sure that it is responding to the contours of that wound and absorbing and managing that exudate. But it's more about keeping that exudate trapped so it doesn't damage that peri wound skin. Okay, thank you. Um, second question is for you, Lakshmi, and this is, can too much exudate cause infection or will controlling the exudate also prevent infection? So yes, too much exudate. As we know from the presentation earlier, that exudate can be both good and bad news. And while it also fulfills the improving function of a wound healing, especially creating that moist environment, we do know that, say, for example, on a leg ulcer, it can be harmful if there's excessive um, exudate. So like um, Lisa showed the photograph before, because then that means with very wet wound, it takes more on surface, more surface bacteria. And from the color, you can then guess mm -hmm. whether there's bacteria present. And if that's not treated properly using appropriate dressings like we talked earlier, yes, then it goes from colonization to local infection. Okay, thank you. Um, question number three, this is another one for you, Lisa. Uh, how do you protect or repair the wound edges from maceration or the surrounding skin from excoriation? Okay, another good question. I can see we're going to get lots of good questions tonight. Um, so again, you can use a barrier film or cream if you've got if you're making a wound wetter to make it better. So if you know there's a risk of that splat factor, then make sure you're using a barrier film, something to protect that peri wound skin. The other thing is to make sure again, I can't say it enough. It's a dressing that not only absorbs but retains that exudate. It holds it within the, the dressing itself. Um, and a lot of the time, you know, for example, with aqua extra, if you keep it overlapping that surrounding skin, it will actually help to fix any maceration that's there, but it will also help to protect that peri wound skin while it's in place, even if the wound is particularly wet. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, uh, again, another one for you, Lakshmi. Uh, this is from Joy, and this is, do you feel that we have a knee-jerk reaction when we see discolored exudate and, uh, and commence patients on antibiotics when they may not actually need them? Absolutely. This is my favorite topic, Joyce. Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, and I have to say from a com community point of view, we see that a lot in practice. And from this session, I'm hoping clinicians will today take a step back, assess your wound bed, find out exactly what's happening. As I said, if there's a discolored exudate, if it's anything green, we know it's pseudomonas, it can be managed with antimicrobial. And if it's not managed properly, then you know colonization gets critical colonization, then eventually to infection. But also if it is infection, we need to assess the patient systemically and not jump to antibiotics prescribing. But as I say, take a step back, complete your holistic assessment, assess your patient properly, both holistically and systemically, but not jump to prescribing antibiotics. Okay, um, I, I don't, you, everyone at home may not see Lisa um, <laughs> nodding ahead in agreement by there, but Lisa is definitely agreeing with that as well, uh, as well, Lakshmi. Um, so question number five, uh, this is for you, Lisa. Um, well, this is nice, we're just doing a back and forth, so yeah. it's uh, one at a time. Uh, question number five is for Lisa, this is from Anne. Uh, do you need to apply anything to the surrounding skin? Uh, I'm assuming that means once you know, when using the dressing perhaps. Yeah, I guess, thanks Anne. Um, I think again, it's, it's that situation where if you are dealing with a wound that is exuding heavily, if you've got very fragile peri wound skin, then there's absolutely no harm in using a barrier film or a barrier cream to protect that peri wound skin. Um, if you think of an ostomist with a stoma, they use barrier um, preparations all the time routinely. 
So, you know, there's no reason why we shouldn't do the same in, in wound care, especially when we have got leakage. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Um, so back over to you, Lakshmi. This is from uh, Mitch. How often does the dressing need to be changed if the exudate is leaking through the outer dressing? So ideally, if the dressing is leaking, I would reassess what primary and secondary I'm using to start with, because from the case study I've presented, both patients were as one of them, it was even twice daily dressing. So the moment we've reassessed our regime and using more absorbent dressing, we've been able to reduce the exudate, contain it properly. So if you're using appropriate dressing, it's still leaking out, then I would start with daily, but obviously, from my personal experience, if I have used a proper absorbent dressing and a good super absorbent with it, I didn't have to go daily. Okay. Um, next for Lisa then from Susan, uh, where a wound has high exudate levels, but has slough, would the primary short term goal be to manage exudate or remove slough? I've always been taught to change one thing at a time so that effectiveness can be determined. Yep. You'll be very pleased to know you can actually do two birds, one stone um, with this one. So if you think about hydrofiber dressings, for example, it will manage the exudate and debride the wound at the same time. So getting the moisture balance right will help support that autolytic debridement. So if you're using like a hydrofiber dressing, for example, it will cope with that exudate. It will trap it within the fibers of the dressing, but it will also help to break down that dead tissue and lift it away. So you can actually have them both down as your short-term objective with the one dressing. Okay, um, and, and Lisa, just to follow on from that, this is a question from Gemma, which I think is sort of uh, related here. Um, what dressing do you recommend for sluffy wounds? There you go. So if I'm allowed to say the actual name of the dressing, I would We're say- We're not see, you can say what you like. <laughs> I would say Aquacel Extra will cope with the exudate and it will debride the wound. And I think it is one of the real brilliant things of the dressing that a lot of people forget that it does, um, but it is a, a really effective debrider. Okay, good. That tied in, that tied in quite nicely, that uh, second mm -hmm. question. Thank you, Gemma. Um, so the next question is from Sarah. Uh, there are so many dressings out there. How do you know what dressing to use? Um, I'm going to put this to the two of you, I think, um, like what type of dressing to use. So I'll, I'll start with you, Lakshmi. So I would suggest first to make sure you follow your local formulary. Obviously, in my local formulary, we've got Aquacel, hence we, I can talk about the beauty of it and the experience of it. So a hydrofiber, obviously, for managing exudate. And I would say if you do have Aquacel, yes, go for Aquacel. Because as you saw from my case study, they do both manage the exudate and the slough. Okay, thank you. And Lisa? Well, obviously I'm slightly biased. So yeah, I would say Axel Extra, you want to think about um, that as a primary dressing. But obviously if you have a very wet wound, you'll want to start thinking about your secondary dressing. Um, so think about, you know, foam dressings can be useful, but if it's particularly wet, you might want to think about your super absorber dressing. So Convermax, for example, which Luxme showed you earlier on that case study. Um, but again, think about the underlying cause, why the wound is soaking wet in the first place. Because if you can fix that, the dressing is only part of the whole package. Yeah, and I think um, from Luxme's point as well, just checking, uh, you know, seeing what's on your local formulary. I think that's yes. a really important point. And one of the key things is to is, is to really is to know what is on your local formulary. So um, I'd urge you all, if you haven't got a copy, get a copy of it because then you'll at least know what to say. You know, you'll, you'll know um, what you can actually use. Um, so this is a, a question for Lisa from Katka. Um, how do you manage exudate in a heart failure patient who does not tolerate two-layer bandaging? Oh, I knew someone was going to ask this sort of question. That is a really tough one because for these patients that are in heart failure, they tend to have really large, edematous, very pale, hairless, cold legs with no specific wound. They just drip constantly. Um, we can't compress them because of the heart failure a lot of the time. Um, and if the patient can't tolerate it, that makes, you know, and they are, are suitable, it makes it very challenging. So it is very much a case of, 
you're doing symptom control. You're not going to fix this. It's about managing the symptoms. So something that is absorbent, something that is comfortable, work with your patient to find what suits them. So again, it's that absorbency, that retention, protecting that skin um, and yeah, working with your patient to, to get it right. Have you got any suggestions up to me? I would also say skincare. It's very, very important because obviously we do know um, patients with heart failure, especially the skin tend to be very thin and fragile. So making sure we are always looking after the skin integrity using a good emollient, especially. Okay, thank you very much, both. Um, that has uh, neatly brought us on to the uh, to the end of the uh, to the end of the session this evening. Um, the, the, as you can imagine, with so many people watching, there's lots and lots of questions that we didn't get through to. But as I said earlier, we will uh, we'll download those and pass them on to uh, to Lisa and Luxmi for them to uh, have a look at. We'll then create a document which will be available on our website in a. Um, uh, shortly, I won't say exactly when, um, but uh, it, it, it shouldn't take too long. Um, thank you all very, very much for joining us. It's uh, been a lovely, uh, a lovely evening. It's still fairly light here in Cardiff, so which means that uh, I can probably go and have a drink in the garden before uh, before bed. Um, so, Lisa Luxmi, great job. Thank you very much for uh, for a wonderful presentation. Um, there are lots and lots of links that will be flashing up on your screen at the moment uh, for uh, for you to be able to download certificates and for some of the uh, documents which were mentioned in the presentation this evening. Um, please check on our website tomorrow. You'll be able to download a copy of the presentation. I noticed quite a few of you asking if you can uh, if you can get a copy of that, which you can. Thank you very much to my team. Thank you very much to our digital team, Mole. Um, thank you for joining us and we shall see you for our next Facebook Live very soon. Uh, Lisa, Luxmi and everyone watching, good night. Good night. Thank, thank you very much. Good night.